Namaste everyone. Thanks for joining this amazing journey of AWS. I am Kaushik Sharma, an AWS certified graduate in AWS certified solution architect. By the way, if you haven't seen my previous video, I suggest you go through my AWS playlist in which I taught you how to use AWS practically. But if you are done with that playlist or just want to pass the certification, then keep watching this video as I'm going to share my personalized tips and strategies while solving question in real AWS certification exams. So today we are going to talk about how to solve question in any of the AWS certification exam, whether it's solution architect or developer or any other. I will show you how to approach for questions and how you can finalize your preparation for AWS certification exam and test whether you are test ready or not. Before that, click on that red subscribe button and don't forget to press the bell icon right now. As in the next video, I will teach you better thing than AWS. That is how to do automation in AWS practically. So subscribe right now. As I assumed you subscribe, let's continue. Go to the link given in the description and quickly head over to this quiz section. By the way, you can check our other section also. But in this video, we are going to talk about quiz only. So let's click quiz. Select quiz one. So here is our first question. By the way, if you are using at this night, I suggest you use our recently added feature dark mode to our quiz. Or if you just like dark mode, you just have to switch it on. So let's start our quiz with first question. A developer is trying to make API calls using AWS SDK. I suggest you read a question with concentration so you don't have to waste time reading it again and again. The IAM user credential used by the application require multi-factor authentication for all API calls. Which method should the developer use to access the multi-factor authentication protected API? Okay, so here developer wants to access multi-factor authentication protected API. So the next thing I do to solve the question is to mark the keywords. The main keyword in this question is multi-factor authentication protected API. Now after selecting the keyword, let's see the options. But before selecting them, I want you to understand that all option in AWS certification exams seems to be correct and might be they are correct indeed. But we have to choose the best and most cost effective option according to the question. So while selecting correct option, we should know why other three options are wrong. This is the best approach one can use to find correct response. Get session token. So get session token API returns a set of temporary credential for any AWS account or IAM user. The credential consists of an access key ID, a secret access key and a security token. Generally we use get session token if we want to use MFA to protect programmatic calls to specify AWS API operation. Therefore here developer can use get session token with an MFA device to make secure API calls using AWS SDK. So it seems like get session token is the correct answer. But as I told you earlier, we have to choose the best response. That's why we need to check all other options also. Second is decode authorization message. It decodes additional information about the authorization status of a request from an encoded message returned in the response to an AWS request, which doesn't require here. So this cannot be our correct answer. Third is get caller ID. It returns detail about the IAM user or role whose credentials are used to call the operation, which is not asked in the question. And the last one, get federation token. So it is used with the federated user to return a set of temporary security credentials, which I already told you consists of an access key ID, secret access key and a security token. But here application use IAM user credential, not federated user credential. So this cannot be our response. But out of these four, we found only one option to be correct. And we can verify our answer with the keyword we found in our question. That is multi-factor authentication protected API calls. And here only get session token API is used for MFA protected API calls. So let's select the get session token API. It's correct. So here you can check out the detailed explanation why any option is correct or incorrect. And also a short trick. You will also file a reference to the AWS documents directly here. So let's go to the second question. A current architecture uses many lambda function invoking one another as large state machine 
the coordination of this state machine is legacy custom code that breaks easily which aws service can help refactor and manage the state machine here we need a service that can be used to manage lambda functions which are invoking one another so the first thing we do is to mark the keywords the main keyword in this question is lambda function invoking one another the first option is aws data pipeline so a data pipeline is a web service that helps you reliably process and move data between different compute and storage service as well as you can use it on on-premise data sources also second is aws sns with aws sqs so when we want messages to be delivered to the applications that require intermediate notification of event and also if you want the message to be persisted in an amazon sqs queue so that other application can also process it at later time but neither of these will help to manage the state machine third is amazon emr so amazon emr is the industry leading cloud big data platform for processing vast amount of data using the open source tool such as apache spark apache hive apache hbase and many more it make it very easy to set up operate and scale your big data environments by automatic time consuming tasks like provisioning capacity and tuning clusters with emr we can run petabyte scale analysis at less than half of the cost of traditional on premises solution and over three times faster than the apache spark we also run workloads on Amazon EC2 instances, on Amazon EKS that is Elastic Kubernetes Service or on premises using EMR on AWS Outpost. And the last option is AWS Step Function which seems to be correct option as it is a serverless function orchestrator that make it very easy to sequence AWS Lambda function and multiple AWS services into business critical applications. Through its visual interference we can create and run a series of checkpointed and event driven workflows that can maintain the application street. The output of one step act as an input to the next. Each step in our application execute in order as defined by our business logic. Now we can verify our answer with the keyword we found in our question which is lambda function invoking one another which clearly indicates toward AWS step function as in this output of one step act as an input to the next. So here they are invoking each other. So AWS step function is the best fit here. Here you can check out the detailed explanation of why any option is correct or incorrect and the reference to the AWS document also and the short track. So if you haven't subscribed my channel, please subscribe my channel right now. So you will get awesome videos like this. Let's go to the third question. A developer is creating multiple AWS Lambda function that will be using an external library that is not included in the standard lambda libraries what is the best way to make this library available to the functions so here we have to find out the best way to include external library which is not included in the standard lambda libraries first is include the external library with the function code but we should not include an external library within the function code even if it is possible this would result in the bloated code that can slow down our execution time. Second is they store the files in Amazon S3 and reference them from your function code. This would likely result in the increased latency of our function execution. Instead, we should either package the library in the deployment package for our function or we can use the layers. Third one is create a layer in the Lambda that includes the external library. So we can configure our Lambda function to pull in additional code and content in the form of layers. So what is a layer? A layer is a zip archive that contains libraries, a custom runtime or other dependencies. With layers, we can use libraries in our function without needing to include them in our deployment package. Layers let us keep our deployment package small which makes deployment easier. One of the best practice for AWS Lambda function is to minimize our deployment package size to its runtime necessities in order to reduce the amount of time that it takes for our deployment package to download it and unpackage ahead of invocation. Therefore, it is preferable to use layers to store the external libraries to optimize the performance of the function. Last one is create a deployment package that includes the external library. So as I told you earlier, the best practice is to minimize package size. Also, this would require including the library in all function deployment package which is more time consuming and increase package size. 
whereas with the layers we can create a single layer that can be used by all function so the keyword in the question is an external library and to include external library best practice is to use configuration layers in lambda fourth question is a company uses an sqs as standard queue for an application an issue has been identified where applications are picking up message from the queue that are still being processed causing duplication what can a developer do to resolve this issue so here the keyword is duplication and we have to resolve it first option is increase the receive message wait time seconds api action on the queue but it won't help us as receive message wait time second is the length of the time in seconds for which a receive message action waits for a message to arrive this is generally used for configure long polling second option is increase the visibility timeout api on the queue this will be helpful for us as whenever a consumer receives and processes a message from the queue the message is still remains in the queue amazon sqs doesn't automatically delete the message as amazon sqs is a distributed system there is no guarantee that the consumer actually received the message thus it's the responsibility of the consumer to delete the message from the queue after receiving and processing it so immediately after a message is received it remains in the queue to prevent other consumer from processing the message again Amazon SQS sets a visibility timeout a period of time during which SQS prevents other consumer from receiving and processing the message the default visibility timeout for a message is 30 seconds and the minimum is 0 seconds the maximum visibility timeout you can set is 12 hours therefore the best thing the developer can do in this situation is to increase the visibility timeout api action on the queue third option is increase the delay second api action on the queue delay seconds controls the length of time for which the delivery of all messages in the queue is delayed but this won't help us last option is to create a redrive policy for the queue this also won't help us as redrive policy is a string that includes the parameter for the dead letter queue functionality of the source queue as a json object so here in the question there is a one keyword so we can verify our answer with the keyword that is duplication and sqs message duplication can be removed by increasing visibility timeout you can check out the detailed explanation and the amazon reference document here the fifth and the final question is an auto scaling group popularly known as asg of amazon ec2 instance is being created for processing message from an amazon sqs queue To ensure the EC2 instances are cost effective, a developer would like to configure the ASG to maintain the aggregate CPU utilization at 70%. So by reading this much of question, I can clearly know the answer, but I still read it properly and follow the procedure. Which type of scaling policy should the developer choose? First is scheduling scaling policies. This is used to schedule a scaling action at a specific time and date. rather than dynamically adjust according to the load which is required in this case second is target tracking scaling policy with target tracking scaling policy you can select a scaling matrix and set a target value amazon ec2 auto scaling creates and manages the cloudwatch alarm that triggers the scaling policy and calculates the scaling adjust based on the metric and the target value the scaling policy adds or removes capacity as required to keep the metric at or close to the specified target value which in this case is 70% in simple auto scaling policies we define the threshold value and the upper bound the alarm monitors the metric values and when the metric value breaches the threshold the scaling policy is acts and the instances are added or removed as per the policy last option is step scaling policy step scaling policies increase or decrease the current capacity of a scalable target based on a set of scaling adjustment also known as step adjustments the adjustments vary based on the size of the alarm breach all alarms that are breached are evaluated by the application auto scaling as it receives the alarm messages so the keyword in the question is to maintain the aggregate cp utilization at 70% which redirects to the target tracking scaling policy as we have to maintain the capacity at specified target you can check out the detailed explanation here that why any option is correct or incorrect and also the short trick also read the aws document for more information you can share this quiz with your friends and colleagues on all social media platforms 
by clicking these buttons. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel and press the bell icon.